This slab table is the ugliest thing I have ever made. And I'm about to show you why it sucks and the links that I went to to save it and my self-regard as a furniture designer. Let's make a live edge table. This slab made me feel things. First, it made me feel inspired. Then it made me feel sad, panicked, like a moron, and then inspired again, and maybe also a little bit brave. Now, with my little history lesson out of the way, let's talk a bit about the Live Edge console table I was inspired to make. The slab's width ranges from 14 to 17 inches, so allowing for a nicely proportioned overhang, I went for a base width around 12 inches. And in order to make the top the feature of the table, I decided to make it float above the base by recessing these risers on the cross supports. To give the base a bit more energy and complement the curved lines of the live edge, I incorporated very slight curves on the four apron components, as well as into the leg profile. And finally, to really put the focus on the top and to cover up the fact that, if we're really honest, red oak is not that attractive of a wood species, I'm planning to make the base black. So with the wind at my back and ego inflated with visions of how great my little console table would be, I brought it into my shop and started preparing it for a little epoxy work to deal with the checking around this knot. And then I realized I had a little shop partner for the evening. Hi little guy. Naturally, because this is a YouTube video involving wood and epoxy, to begin I grabbed a few awl picks and got to work chipping out any bark inclusions and junk in these knot check cracks. If trees had noses, this would basically be the equivalent of picking their boogers out and then filling them permanently with plastic. Uh, that analogy breaks down rather quickly. Okay, I promised some drama about how this top made me feel. This is where I had my first, I'm gonna call it an incident, with this top. So it has this knot in it, which is checked, leaving a hole that goes all the way through. The ideal way to fix this is by making a mold, usually out of melamine board, pasting up the corners and cracks with silicon caulk, using some kind of mold release, and then pouring epoxy. But that just feels like a lot of work. So instead, I just put some of this plastic window seam tape on this rough wood slab and hoped for the best. This was a terrible idea. The leak started slow, but man was it persistent. After pouring this and going inside for the night, I had the good sense to tell my wife I needed to go back and check it and make sure it wasn't leaking. And thankfully I did, because it was just everywhere. My strategy for dealing with this was, well, more of the same. Oh, except this time I added caulk to the equation. Add some tape, stuff in some caulk. When that didn't work, I actually ended up just screwing this whole tape-lined plate over the bottom to get it to stop leaking, and that slowed it down, but ultimately, I got my ridiculous tape caulk method to work. When I'm just starting a base like this, I like to make my first task what I call finding my parts, which when I say it out loud, I realize now is an odd name. But what I mean is breaking down larger chunks of wood roughly into smaller chunks that my table components will come out of, but not cutting anything to final size and just labeling them to help me keep track of everything. I make each one intentionally oversized so I have some margin to work within when it's that component's moment on stage, so to speak. Each rough part goes through a milling process where the goal is to get each side flat, smooth, and the edges square to each other, and the faces parallel to each other and to my desired thickness. Okay, so one of my goals with this piece is to try my hand at introducing more curves to my designs. This was easy enough to do in Fusion 360 when I made my model, but I knew I'd need some help doing it right when actually making the legs. So I basically just pulled the dimensions from my drawing and drew out a full-size version on a sheet of paper first. Then I cut that out and traced it onto this piece of MDF. With this tricky, curvy part of the template drawn out, the rest was straightforward since there's just a slight taper on the rest of the legs. Making this template would have been much easier on a CNC machine, but my wife tells me I'm not allowed to get one until I have a bunch more subscribers to justify it. So if you're enjoying this video so far, it would help out a ton if you'd subscribe to the channel and give it a like. Even better, leave a comment to tell me what you're enjoying or how dumb my jokes are. 
I'm happy to hear from you either way. Template routing is the way to go when working with non-rectangle shaped components. I'm a big fan of this double-sided tape from Taylor Toolworks, particularly because it's so thin and yet still really sticky pressure activated tape. I really do recommend it. I stuck this template on and cut these out on the bandsaw, which I'm not sure why I did it like that instead of just tracing it out and then sticking it on while I routed it, but I digress. But while I inexplicably do that, I'll offer a tip about double-sided tape. Don't try to save tape and don't reuse it. I don't know how many times I've tried to be stingy with my tape by reusing it with a second component and then trying to route it. It's not worth ruining a workpiece to save a foot of tape. Just take it all off and replace it between parts. I've heard a lot of folks complain about how difficult red oak is to work with, but you know what? They're right, it's not great. But if you read the grain carefully, it is possible to plane it fairly smooth. And you can see here where I intentionally left off routing the ends of the legs so that I could refine it by hand. This helps prevent catastrophic end grain blowout by just avoiding it entirely. Quick tip, if you need to sand an inside curve like this and don't wanna risk overdoing it on a powered spindle sander, just take the drum off and use it by hand to dial it in slowly. And now, everyone's favorite part to see, joinery. So I grabbed my domino, changed the bit over to the 10 millimeter cutter, hooked up my Rockler Dustrite FlexiPort Power Tool Hose Kit with Quick Connect, link in the description, and drilled some domino mortises. Every woodworker knows that complicated glue-ups are always pretty stressful. One thing I've found that nearly eliminates that stress when using floating tenons is to pre-glue your dominoes, dowels, or tenons into one side first, clean up excess glue, and let it cure before moving on. I always glue them into the apron pieces, for example, because that's where you'd cut a solid tenon if you weren't using a floating one. So this step basically takes the floating tenon and stops it from floating, I guess, so now it's a fixed tenon. I stuck the table together without glue so I could pull length measurements for these interior cross pieces. These will extend above the top of the legs and aprons and give the top a floating appearance. Another woodworking tip here, for pieces like this that don't set the dimensions of your piece like aprons do, Pull the dimensions directly off your actual piece instead of cutting them to length from your drawing or plans. You'll likely always be slightly off by a fraction and working from actual measurements helps ensure that you get a tight fit and don't leave gaps. With my rough blanks cut out and milled for these three risers, I worked out a template to cut out these corners. This will pull them back from the edges and basically hide them from view. And here we go again with a familiar process. Make a template, use a template, and boom, three matching riser pieces. I took a minute and laid these out on the long aprons so that I could attach them with dominoes. And you'll see here to drill these in the middle of the board, I just clamp the piece on my line and back the domino up to it, which keeps the machine steady and straight while drilling. Okay, continuing on with the thread of giving woodworking advice, always dry fit if you can before gluing up your stuff. The reason glue-ups are often stressful is usually due to finding out something doesn't fit right only after you've slathered it with tons of glue. For example, this would have been a glue-up nightmare because I'm a dummy and drilled this one on the same side of my layout lines instead of mirroring it on one of them. And don't worry, I made sure and did a janky job of filling up the mistake mortises with plain dominoes where it will be invisible once I paint this base black. 
Now let's try this dry assembly again. Much better. Order of operations is such an important aspect of woodworking. For example, I knew I'd be mounting my top to this base without having access to the aprons like I normally would to use things like Z-clips. So instead, I'm gonna drill through my riser stretchers and attach it with screws. This operation would have been impossible to do after glue up. The holes I'm making here are counterboard to allow the use of shorter screws, and the through holes are oversized in order to allow for seasonal wood movement. And because my bits aren't long enough to go through these five inch wide stretchers, I'm drilling the two different size holes from opposite sides. One thing I've learned as a furniture designer in my distinguished three year career designing furniture is that subtle details do a lot to elevate the look of a piece from simple to refined. And it's not hard. Here I'm using a somewhat stiff off cut strip to help me draw curves on these aprons. This one is walnut because I like my jigs and fixtures to be made of only the finest materials. To set this up, you saw me put clamps at each end of the apron. Those clamps will hold the strip at the right place, so all I have to do is mark the center of my apron, move it to where the curve looks good, and the walnut curve marking strip takes care of the rest. Usually I do this just once on a template and then use that template to copy the curve onto this piece. But again, no CNC, and at this point, I'm tired of making so many templates for a one-off piece. Each one of these got carefully cut out on the bandsaw and refined with a bit of hand sanding or planing to remove the bandsaw marks and get it smooth. After a quick hour or two, sanding all my base parts up to 150 grit, I apply some subtle round overs to my base parts and glue it up. Now, I won't go into how boring this glue up was, but since I had done my homework before adding glue to the mix, it was fairly uneventful. However, I will show a helpful tip for you here. If you have squeeze out in your corners like this, don't just let it dry thinking you'll cut it out later. That's too much work. Instead, take a card scraper like this one with really pointy square corners and rake out the glue while it's still wet. Then wipe up any excess with a wet rag. So here you go glam clamp shots. Those curves turn out quite nice if I do say so. Now it's time to turn our attention back to the top and you're not gonna wanna miss what happens when I set it on this base. Now, as you might've expected, the top was an absolute mess. Epoxy, caulk, and tape everywhere. I tried tackling it with a drywall knife, my carbide scraper, and chisels with limited success. Eventually, I realized it's not a big deal if I gouge it a bit because I'm going to be surfacing it again anyway. So I just made a little jig plate for my router and put a little surfacing bit on there and went to town. Flip it over and just a little more work to do on the top side. I was more careful on this side because it had already been flattened and would be my reference surface when putting it through the planer. To clean up the back edge, I just shaved off a strip with the track saw and finished it off with the Ryoba where the six and a half inch blade wouldn't quite reach. And since this is a live edge table, the live edge needed a little love. These nylon drill wheels do a good job removing a lot of the soft bits that might degrade over time if I left them in, but aren't so aggressive that they start shaping it like a carving disc. This frayed area was cracked, so I did my best to cut it away in a way that looked natural. Since this top is too wide for my 15 inch planer, I took it over to my friend Warner's shop to put it through his 24 inch monster planer. It made quick work of it, getting it flat in only one pass on each side. I started this story talking a lot about how this table made me feel. Well, up to this point, I was feeling great about this project. And at this particular moment, I was feeling pretty great in general because just two weeks before, my baby daughter was born and I had just taken a couple weeks off work to wake up four times a night to help my wife take care of her. But I'm also anticipating seeing my table put together for the first time. The picture of it I had in my mind was so clear and I was sure I was gonna love it. So after cutting the ends square and getting these burn marks off, with one final pass, it was time to set it up there and take a look. I looked at this table from every angle and no matter what I tried, I absolutely hated it. 
I hated it. As a slab, I thought the natural edge looked cool, and I could picture it in someone's entryway, but no matter what I tried, it just looked, well, ugly. It felt clunky and too thick. The proportions in relation to the base were just all wrong. I was kicking myself for thinking that this was a good idea. I felt like an idiot, and a terrible designer. How could I fix this table that I had just spent so much time making, and so much effort on the epoxy work on this slab? Then, an idea struck me, and it was extreme. I wasn't able to completely cut off the whole live edge without making the top too narrow, but it was just a matter of repairing this corner. They say you can't add wood back. Well, that's garbage. That's what wood glue is for. You just have to be clever about it. I'm going to carefully hand plane this profile flat and then use the exact same offcut I just dramatically tossed into the trash, flip it around and glue it here to get the best grain match possible. There's no need to pre-shape this piece much because I want to make sure that I start with enough wood to get a flat profile on all sides. There isn't a great way to clamp a piece like this, but you'll be surprised how tight of a seam you can get with just hand clamping pressure for a few seconds and good glue coverage and squeeze out. Once it's dry, you can carefully cut it off with a pull saw. The tape here helps in two ways. It protects the top from saw marks and it elevates the blade by a hair so there's just enough material remaining after these cuts are complete to finesse it with a little hand planing. And now it does fit through my planer. Just barely. While I knock out a few finish details on the top, I want to take a second to say a quick thank you to everyone who's been watching my videos and encouraging me to keep going. I'm still new to making videos of my work, but I feel your support already. But if you'd like to show even more support for the channel, I started a Patreon page. So if that's something you're interested in, I'll put a link in the description where you can sign up. And if Patreon's not your thing, no worries. A like and subscribe would also go a long way to help out, and I deeply appreciate either one. Seriously. Now, let's get back to the build. As I said before, the small design details are often what elevates the look of a piece most. And now that my piece no longer looks like it was designed by a kindergartner, I felt like one last detail would make all the difference. With the square edge, it still felt too thick even after planing it down to an inch and a half. So I decided to add these under bevels as a final touch. And what these shots make me realize is that my track saw dust collection is pretty bad. It's funny to me that probably the most important part of building furniture other than design is the least interesting part to watch. I'm talking about finishing. Even seeing the base transform from the hideous pink color of red oak to this sexy black general finishes enduro poly is only enjoyable to watch for a minute. So to make this tabletop one that someone would love to look at for a long time, I used a custom dye mix to give it a more desirable color and gave it a couple coats of Osmo Pollux, which has really become my go-to hard wax oil. It's no monocoat, but you don't have to mix up multiple components, it smells better, and it still comes in a bunch of pretty interesting colors and tints. And no, that wasn't a sponsorship read. I just actually like, buy, and use Osmo, and recommend it. But if you want to support the channel by using an affiliate link to get some, I left one for you in the description. So here's the big question. Was all this effort to save my design worth it? Did I take this ugly duckling of a table design and turn it into a swan? You be the judge. All I know is I slept a lot better after I cut off the live edge and took it in a different direction. It just goes to show that as creative as we try to be, what we see in our mind's eye doesn't always work in reality. 
one of the best skills we can develop as makers is the ability to let go of an idea, to pivot, to make fun of ourselves for a our ridiculous idea, humbly change our minds, and then creatively pick a new direction. I'm glad I did on this one. And if you want to buy this table, it's for sale on my website. Thanks for watching.